Okay, everybody, welcome. Welcome to Zipster's Magic Show. So uh, in this, in this um, presentation, we're going to show you a challenge that has been the, the lizard has dropped to Zipster. And um, we're going to highlight a lot of, you know, enterprise um, solutions with FME. And we're really going to push um, FME to the limit. And now this is a really big challenge. So the Zipster the Zipster called three of us to help him do it. So uh, my name's Don Murray and I'm one of the co-founders and um, I'm on with, um, do you wanna say hi, Grant? Yeah, my name's Grant. I'm a senior software developer at Safe Software and I work with FME Server and basically deploying FME Server, everything related to deploying. Oh, nice, and Laura. Yeah, my name is Laura. I'm uh, one of the uh, the team leads for our FME Server Experts group here. So it's always fun to, to experiment with server and see what happens when we try to break some stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And the three of us, um, it really took all three of us to pull this off. Um, and you'll see as we go through who, who um, did each piece, but it was a lot of fun to, uh, to do this and to break a few things along the way. And we'll share um, all of that uh, with you. So thanks Grant and Laura for joining me as we help the, the Zipster um, on the Lizard Challenge. So yeah. So, um, so Laura, you wanna talk about some fun facts? Yeah, for sure. So it's kind of introducing another star of the show here, the heavy lifter, the FME engines. Um, yeah, so this is the part that will actually do our job processing. So it's the piece of FME that runs the FME workspaces. So one good thing to know is a single FME engine can only process one job at a time. So if you need to process multiple jobs at once in parallel, you need to make use of FME server with multiple engines attached to it. Hmm, interesting. I have a funny feeling that that'll be important as we move ahead here. Okay, so um, our goal for this presentation is, um, is to push FME to the limits. The lizard has laid down his challenge and, um, and we're going to need to build the largest deployment of all time. And before we start talking about the particulars of this, we have a poll. And the poll is, can you guess how many engines we successfully added to our FME server? Was it 100? Was it 250? Was it 500? Or was it 1,000? Um, not, I tended to, on these things, I'd always pick C. I read somewhere, if you don't know the answer to pick C, and you're going to actually do better than if you pick um, any of the other ones. And so with that, we'll see um, how, how people vote here. Oh, here they come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You people pick a hundred. Oh, I wouldn't pick a hundred. You know, never pick the never pick the, the extremes is generally a rule. Okay. Okay, so we'll shut this down in uh, ten seconds. So vote quick. Okay, so all the votes are in and. The answer actually is, what's the answer, Grant? 1,000 engines connected. 1,000 engines, which is crazy. But we're going to go for it. The Zipster, we did that nothing to do with this. The Zipster and the Lizard came up, and they just called us in after they'd already um, built this challenge. So, uh, so yeah, so 1,000 engines. OK, so again, the. the the focus of this was sharing with you the process, um, the challenges and the things we learned. It's all about when we do this, um, the things we learned. We totally expected to break a few things along the way. And, um, and we had fun breaking things and then um, looking at how we could get, you know, get around them to truly make this incredibly huge um, FME server deployment. Um, we hope at the end that you leave with some, some ideas, some tips and some things to consider um, when you go on your way to build a massive FME uh, deployment. Yeah, so FME is packed with many, uh, many huge deployment um, features. And so we're going to look at all of them and, um, and how we can tackle um, a data set of any size. Okay. So Grant, do you want to talk about What's going on in the world of data? Yeah, so uh, every year, uh, there's more and more data being created. It's just the, the amount of data that's created every year is increasing. Um, so with all this new data, massive data volumes, uh, when you process that data, you're gonna have to scale up 
your data processing in order to to handle all that data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Wow, it's grown like exponentially. That's that looks a lot like a hockey stick. So yeah, with that in mind, uh, today what we're going to be looking at is a challenge is going to get thrown down, and uh, we're going to see a number of tricks uh, that can be used to uh, to handle that challenge. So first, uh, some improvements in FME 2021 that that will be helpful. Um, the second trick is parallel processing, which is splitting your job up into multiple smaller jobs so they can be processed in parallel. And we'll see a real-time visualization, which uh, can just show us the data as it's being processed. Uh, and then dynamic engines, which are a really good way of, um, of leveraging FME server to have a massive number of engines when you need them. And then at the end, all those will come together for the big performance and we'll see if the challenge can be handled. Oh, I'm getting nervous. I'm getting nervous. So, so Laura, what is the challenge? Mm -hmm. So the lizard's challenge for Zipster here. So he's got a massive processing task that takes 9,000 hours or about a year to complete when using a single engine on FME 2020. So the challenge is to complete that same task, but finish it in an hour using 2021. Can it be done? Ooh. The, the lizard looks pretty, pretty confident that it can't there as he's you know, in bed, like he's having a popcorn bath. And I got to say, the zipster <laughs> does look a little worried. And yeah, for sure. Yeah, so the, the task is to, um, um, as Laura mentioned, we have, um, we're going to process all of Canada. And, um, and the way we did is we divided it up by, you know, 31,000, essentially 31,000 hexagons. And then we process each, um, all this data in each hexagon. Um, do all the processing in each hexagon and um, with one engine FME 2020 this takes as Laura said one year and so our goal is to build a deployment um, gauging all the tricks of FME 2021 in such a way that it takes um, just a single hour and um, yeah so uh, you know the the lizard here or sorry the zipster gulp that's a pretty big challenge. And this is gonna require some serious FME magic and uh, the Zipster called in some, uh, some friends, uh, i.e. me, Grant and Laura to pull this off. So, yep, so the, the, the requirements, just one more time. Um, the other thing is, is we want this to be cost effective. So we don't want to um, you know, spend you know, too much money to make this happen. We also, the Zipster has um, an FME server running for other workflows and we don't wanna completely uh, you know, decimate those. And since this is, a, in this case, this is a one-time trick for the World Fair, we wanna be able to bring this up and, and bring this um, infrastructure down really, really quickly, again, in the interest of keeping our costs um, in line. So, so follow along with the Zipster and see how he pulls this off. Yeah, so I think for the first trick, uh, this is maybe one of the easiest tricks um, that the Zipster can can do is just upgrading to FME 2021.0. So in all of our FME releases, we, we strive to make FME faster than it was before. Um, and you can see in the slide, there's many areas that are, are a lot faster. And so, um, yeah, just by installing FME 2021 and using that instead of 2020.2, um, you can get a massive speed increase. And yeah, with that first trick, uh, that takes the processing from 9,000 hours to 1,000 hours, so nine times increase. So that's a that's a good start, I would say. Mm -hmm. but not down to one hour yet. No, no. And um, yeah, so maybe if we waited till 2024, it would just happen. You never know, right? We could just tell the Zipster, you know, to wait. And if we just did it with one engine, maybe it would be better for him just to wait for a future release. Um, um, right, and still get it done quicker. But anyway, so the next trick obviously is now we got it down to 1000 hours. We still have 1000 hours to go. So um, what we want to do now is build some a workspace to be able to split that uh, processing up into so we can distribute it across many engines. I mean, luckily, in this case, the processing was done hexagon by hexagon, we know we have 31,000 hexagons. And so it should be relatively easy to um, just split this up across, um, um, we, let's see, we have to make it a thousand times faster than one engine. So I think we're gonna need a thousand engines here, Grant. What do you think? 
That sounds right, but that also sounds like a lot of engines. Sounds like a lot of engines, yeah. And so to do this, we um, what the Zipster did is he used a common enterprise integration pattern, the splitter pattern, to break the large job into 1,000 smaller jobs. So there's the, uh, the workspace there. Full disclosure, it does break my 10 transformer limit. But using bookmarks, I was able to uh, to make it look like it, like it didn't. So it's a really uh, a simple workspace. It simply um, breaks all the hexagons up into groups of of um, H three indexes, and then uses the automation writer to push that downstream. So that's the first one, and the second workspace is the one that actually does the work. And this workspace um, simply is given a list of H three indexes to process. And it does the processing, um, does the heavy grinding. And then when the grinding is done, it outputs it. To, um, um, it basically lets um, the system know that, that it's done. So, and Laura will talk a little bit about that later. Okay. And the automation, um, here we go. So Zipster then took those two workspaces and put them in an automation. So you can see the splitter workspace there with the um, automation writer. And the automation writer will output in this case, a thousand messages. So that'll cause the H3 area processor to be run um, a thousand times. And those jobs are submitted immediately. So you effectively have as many H3 area processors running at the same time as engines. And that's what Laura talked about um, earlier is that if you want parallelism, you just have engines. Well, we want all 1000 to run at the same time. So we need a thousand engines if we're gonna pull this off. And, um, and so that indeed is serious uh, parallelism. Yeah, and since I have a thousand small jobs, I wanna process in parallel, I'll need a thousand. This will be, we think the largest FME deployment ever. We've never had a customer come to us wanting to launch a thousand engines. Um, and there are some big deployments out there for sure, but, uh, but not this big. And, um, and so that's what it kind of looks like. You submit the job, and you have it spread across a thousand engines. Okay, so, but first, you know, it would be kind of boring if we just ran it and then we, you had to take our word for it. Yep, it finished. And so this is where Laura and her, um, we reached out to Laura with the Zipster and said, Laura, what can we do to actually show the progress? And so she asked a few questions and then now Laura is gonna describe to us exactly how this uh, works. Yeah, so we just put together a pretty simple web page here since we're doing since uh, the process here is kicking out a bunch of hexagons that'll be all over Canada. Figured a simple web map would be a good fit for this, so we can see the hexagons uh, appear on the map as the process runs. So we've also got a little timer up in the corner there to to help us keep track of how long it's taking to run this process as well. So we want yeah. this under sixty minutes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes, we have to get it done within 60 minutes. The, uh, the lizard was pretty serious about that. So, yeah. And so the real time, um, the visualization trick, um, you want to talk about this, Laura? Yeah, sure. So we made use of web sockets to be able to show these hexagons on the map. Um, so they'll appear in real time instead of having to refresh the page or anything like that. Uh, so we use the WebSocket sender transformer within the workspace. So as soon as these hexagons are finished processing, uh, they get sent out through the WebSocket sender as JSON to the map. And then we parse that JSON and display it on the map as they come through. Very, very cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And um, yeah, so now the lizard, he's pretty impressed. Whoa, Zipster, you know, this is pretty impressive. But he, of course, you know, wants to remind the Zipster of the requirements. Um, you know, you can't, you can't bank, you know, break the bank on this one. You can't tie up my existing server because there's other great workflows for, at the World's Fair. And um, this is a one-time thing. So I don't want whatever you do to be laying around. I want everything to just disappear. So that kind of meant we couldn't go out to the Best Buy and uh, buy you know, a thousand machines for, for example. So, um, because we'd still have to, I mean, we'd probably have to sell them at a loss, but anyway, so there we go. So, yeah. Okay. Time for the fourth trick. Wow. The Zipster's really engaging it all. And the fourth, 
Fourth trick is dynamic engines. So people often ask, what's the, you know, from a capability standpoint, how are dynamic engines different than standard engines? And they're 100% the same. Um, the only thing that's different is with dynamic engines is you just pay for the work or the CPU time that's used. You don't pay for the engine. So that means you could launch as many engines as you want, 100, 500, 1,000, a million, whatever you want and you only pay for the CPU time that's used. There's no per engine cost. And that is important um, for, this, um, for, for this particular workflow um, because if you look at the cost difference, um, if you did come to SAFE and said, I wanna buy a thousand standard engines and um, we just quoted you list price, you would be um, you know, paying about 6.5 million um, we wouldn't even worry about the currency, you know, so in this case, it's US, but we, you could probably negotiate a better price on that. So if you do want a thousand engines, be sure to reach out. However, if you come to us and um, for dynamic engines, we don't even ask you how many engines you're going to launch. Um, we just simply um, quote the, we sell you them in, in blocks, which you'll see in the next slide. But in this case, it would be... Um, $1,600 to do one year of processing. So nine, that was 9,000 hours of processing was um, $1,600. And so, you know, prior to dynamic engines, big data lifts were very difficult. And some users reached out to us and we would talk about, you know, giving you standard engine for a reduced period of time and things like that. But dynamic engines just open up a whole new world of possibilities with FME server. And for this one, they are definitely key. And so, yeah, so just in summary, there you go. That's how we figured it out. And the big, the nice thing is, is with dynamic engines, once the job's finished, then the engines aren't processing anything. And so there's, there's zero cost when they're just um, up, but not um, doing any work. So you only pay for what you use. And um, of course, um, as you buy more time, the hourly cost goes down. So in this case, we needed a thousand hours. So you could see um, it fit into the, the bottom, the top tier. But if you need to do this periodically over and over again, or you embrace dynamic engines across your organization, and then the more hours, the, the lower the, the cost per hour. So, yeah. And with that, I think Grant's going to describe a number of attempts and um, it should just work, right, Grant? Just Oh, yeah, definitely. This, this should be easy. Yeah. Only a thousand engines. I mean, yeah. So, uh, you know, for this kind of deployment, um, to think about how you're going to deploy it. And so the Zipster chose uh, Amazon EKS, which is Amazon's managed Kubernetes service. So Kubernetes cluster is just a way of deploying containerized applications um, across a number of machines. And this is a, a really good deployment if you want to scale like this. You want to be able to scale things up and down. Um, Kubernetes makes that really easy. And then the other part of that too is Fargate. So um, AWS Fargate is uh, a serverless technology, which means that you don't have to worry about the actual machine that the, um, the container is running on. You just say, I want a thousand containerized engines, and then they just run, and you just have to specify how big they are. So this is, this is also nice when you're scaling massively like this, not having to worry about the nodes. So yeah, this this seems like a good attempt. So the Zipster will create a, a cluster in EKS with a Fargate profiles to run engines in Fargate, launch a thousand engines, run the job, and uh, that should be it. So here we go. Let's see if this works. And it failed. Um, so it turns out that there is um, a limit on how fast you can launch Fargate containers. So and the Zipster tried to go from zero to a thousand right away. Uh, it stopped at about a hundred engines and uh, got an error from AWS saying uh, that we were throttled um, because of rate limiting. Now, the, the note about this is we could contact AWS support and say, uh, we'd like to launch more at once and 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 um, I'm sure they'd let us, but that takes time and we, we want to get this going, so. Yeah. Okay, so attempt one. Oh, the lizard looks, um, he looks, it looks kind of smug there, I'm going to say, you know, yeah. I think in, in deep inside, he was hoping that this would have worked because it would have been really simple, but um, he looks a little smug. Yeah, he's not saying too much. Okay, so, so Grant, what did we do next? Well, we're not going to give up yet. So, um, so the next, so if we can't use Fargate, that's okay. We can still use, um, 
regular nodes in a, a Kubernetes cluster. And actually, there's a nice thing in AWS called spot instances. And spot instances are instances that you get for much cheaper, with the caveat that they can be shut down on you uh, with a little bit of warning. Uh, but that it's good for this kind of workflow because if our workloads only going to be running for about an hour, uh, there's a lower chance that we're going to get um, get terminated in that time. And also, if if a engine does get terminated that's running, it can requeue the job and and process it again. So this seems like a good case for for doing this really cheaply. So similar to the last uh, the last strategy, we're going to use Kubernetes instead of Fargate. We're going to create a node group for spot instances, um, and then we uh, the Zipster can put something in the cluster called an auto scaler uh, that will automatically scale up those nodes um, when it needs more capacity. So as we launch more engines, uh, it'll see that they can't fit on the current number of nodes, and it'll automatically launch more nodes for us. So this also makes it easy to scale up. Uh, so then we can just launch the thousand engines run the job and that should be it. Nice, sounds makes total sense. Okay. All right, so let's see if this works. Yeah. And we hit another limit, uh, another AWS limit. So actually there's a limit on how many virtual CPUs you can run in spot by default in your AWS account. And so we got up to 500 engines, but um, then we hit, hit the limit. And again, we could contact AWS and say, hey, we'd like to use more spot than that many CPUs and and uh, they could raise it for us. But then again, that would take time to reach out to them and wait for them to get back to us. We want to get this moving. So. Uh oh, so I'm I don't know. bad feeling about this. The lizard still looks a little smug. Yeah. So yeah, he does. He looks really smug. Yeah, a, a little bit sad, but smug. Yeah. So we're not going to let that stop us. Uh, if we can't use spot, that's okay. We can still use on-demand instances. It <laughs> may, might cost us a little more money, but it's still not prohibitively expensive. Um, and we know that our AWS account is allowed to launch enough um, instances um, if they're on demand um, to handle this. So, so similar to the old one, we'll use Kubernetes. Um, we'll use on demand instances instead of Spot, um, and we'll we'll launch the engines 100 at a time uh, to get up to 1,000. Uh, once we hit 1,000, we can run the job, and uh, that should be it. No problem. Sounds sounds good. Okay. Third time's a charm. I think Third so. I'm, charm, I'm feeling good. Yeah, I'm feeling yeah. good about this one. Well, that we got up to about 700 engines and everything was looking okay until the rest requests on the server started to slow down gradually. Um, when the server was running normally, we'd get less than 100 milliseconds, I'd say, for a rest request. And um, once we hit 700 engines, we, it was in, measured in the tens of seconds. It was very slow and it kind of gradually got slower and slower. So this is not good. It means we aren't going to be able to, to submit our jobs fast enough. And the, the server is mostly unusable when it's this slow. Yeah, yeah. And the lizard, the lizard's look there, he's looking a little more confident. He's, he's opened one eye more. He's starting to, he's starting to taste uh, that the poor Zipster is not going to be able to do this. So. Mm -hmm. so he even says, Zipster, you're crazy for thinking this would actually work. Yeah, he looks, uh, he looks pretty confident. So what happened then? Well, uh, while the lizard's enjoying his popcorn, the Zipster is not done yet. Um, and thinking about it, we actually only had a single FME server core to, to handle these 1,000 engines, which in hindsight doesn't seem like it would be enough. All the engines have to connect to the core um, for it to be able to give it jobs and things like that. Um, so with a little bit of research, it turns out that a core probably can't support a thousand engines all by itself. Um, and it's probably more like the number is 300. So I think the Zipster has an idea of what to do next. More server cores. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. So um, scaling up from one core to four cores um, so that we can have 250 engines per core and launch all the engines. And Eureka, you got a thousand engines to connect. Uh, the, the rest requests were just as fast as they were before. Um, and the engines are sitting there ready to process jobs. So I think we can uh, use this deployment to, to try this workflow. Yeah, exciting, exciting. And the Zipsters, what has he got? Bubbles coming out of his wand there or something? He's looking pretty- uh, The magic looking, is happening. He's looking pretty happy now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so back to the automation. So now we're trying to run this thing and um, 
when we went to run it, we noticed that um, when we launched the thousand jobs, um, remember they all come up r relatively at the same time. Um, the WebSocket server wasn't able to handle um, a thousand simultaneous um, requests to establish a connection. And, um, and so, that, so that was a problem because visualization is obviously a huge part of this. And maybe trying to have a thousand things right to one WebSocket server at the same time is a bit crazy, but, but that's what we decided to do. Um, but fortunately in automations, in FME 2021, we now have this retry capability. And so what we'd said on the H3 area processor, we just um, selected retry, specified a few parameters as you see there. And now when these, um, these engines, when they go to try to connect to the WebSocket server, if they fail, they just do a back off and then the automation resubmits the job to try again. And doing this, we were able to get all 1,000 engines to actually connect to the web, the WebSocket uh, web server. Okay, so the big performance now. Okay, so here we go. So um, the lizard there and Zipster, this is here we go. Now we've built this thing. So now we're actually gonna see um, what happens. Okay, oh, so there we go. Okay, so the, the lizard now is starting to feel good about this, his little buddy. Um, he thinks that little buddy's gonna pull this off. Well, we need to remember that the Zipster didn't do this by himself. Um, he had Grant and uh, Laura. He probably could have done my workspaces and the automations because he's pretty good at that kind of stuff. But when it comes to deploying in the cloud and visualization, um, him and I would have just had to, you know, like hug and say, I'm, I don't know either. And um, yeah, so there you go. But uh, so here we go. So, and this is the screenshots showing the difference. Okay, it, it will go back to zero in a minute and then you'll see um, how it goes. So here you go. So you can see um, the difference. And um, the one on the right, obviously, is the thousand engines running, right, writing to the web. And in, by golly, it does finish um, within uh, 60 minutes processing the entire country. And on the other side, they're green dots you can see well, it gets uh, one one thousandth of the way through. So, uh, yeah, so that's um, really exciting. There was a funny story along the way. Um, initially, we were using 216,000 hexagons, which 30,000 looks more pleasing, but the clock actually slowed down because the clock on the web browser is using JavaScript. And there was so much data and so much going on in the web browser that the clock um, ran slower and slower and slower. So then we changed it to, uh, so that's just, you know, another example of funny things you hit when you're, you know, pushing things to the limit. Uh, and so, yeah, so there we go. And um, yeah, success. So the lizard, he's, he's, a, he's, he's gracious and he says, great job, Zipster, you pulled it off. But uh, the lizard is, you know, popcorn is kind of the thing that he likes the most. And um, time to celebrate and grab some popcorn. He probably should have taken Zipster out, you know, for a really nice meal, but uh, you know, like steak or, or whatever the, you know, the Zipster likes to eat. Maybe he eats oil. I don't know. Maybe he'd take him out for an oil change. I don't know. So, yeah. So any, anything you want to add to, uh, to that grant? Oh, I think it's, uh, it's great. And uh, yeah, I think they, they can both celebrate, you know, both be happy about this. That, uh, That's right. That's right. How about you, Laura? Mm, yeah, it's exciting to see we were able to pull that off. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's some key takeaways. So what were some of the key takeaways, Grant? Yeah, so uh, of course, we ran into a few different limits that AWS has. So I think it's important when you're, you're trying to do something at this scale that you you know what those limits are and, and then you can either increase them by talking to AWS or, or you know, work around them. But, um, yeah. but yeah, definitely important to know. One of the other things that we hit um, is related to the Postgres database. And, um, you know, FB server has to connect to the database to do a number of different things. The cores have to have connections. And in some cases, the engines have connections. And uh, there was one point where we we ran out of the, there's a, there's a default limit in Postgres on how many connections it can have simultaneously. And we hit that limit at one point. Um, and so it's just something to be aware of that if you're going to have, you know, multiple cores like this and, um, and engines potentially using database connections that you, you might need to bump that limit up. So that's what we did. Um, just to get, make sure everything worked. Yeah, yeah. 
How about you, Laura? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that part with the FME server cores and the number of engines that each one can support is an interesting thing to know about. So looks like it's about 300 engines per core. So if you're looking to have a massive system like this, then it's a good limit to be aware of. Yeah. Um, the other piece here is those dynamic engines. Um, so those are super powerful and it's a great way to have a, a more cost effective uh, configuration for being able to process uh, huge amounts of data or handling large spikes in demand as you're running workflows. Yeah, yeah. And um, <clears throat> yeah, and we did learn a lot and, <clears throat> and Grant touched on one of them there. Um, you know, as we look to larger and larger deployments, we'll need to think about how all the engines are talking to Postgres, you know, maybe we put a micro, you know, server API on top of it to, to and things like that. And, um, and the server course, 300 engines per core is pretty good. But again, it's always good to look at this and understand where it started to fall apart and to see if you can, you know, make it, you know, make it bigger. And, um, and there were some server web pages, for example, that we just knew we couldn't go to, um, i.e. the deployments graph um, wasn't, I think, it, I think Grant said it would come back after 20 minutes or something. But, you know, when you start having these massive deployments, um, you know, we've always been thinking, you know, tens or maybe a hundred engines. And so to take it to a thousand is a whole new level. So we have a document that we we created as we went through this, all the different things that we learned to, um, you know, to make FME server be able to scale even bigger. And who knows, maybe next year we'll be back and we'll go for 10,000 engines. I mean, the great thing about um, AWS is now that infrastructure is, you know, with all the cloud-based uh, um, deployments, whether it be AWS, Azure, or Google, now you can actually um, build these massive deployments to solve these big problems in, in crazy fast time. Whereas you would never do this if it was physical hardware. It's just, you know, yeah, yeah. Our finance guy, if I said to him, hey, I want to buy a thousand machines or, you know, or even 250 machines, because I think I can squeeze four engines on each one. Um, you know, there would have been a bit of paperwork and I'm sure it wouldn't have, uh, have happened. Never mind, where do we plug them all in? And there's just no end of the problems that would have, uh, we would have had to deal with. Um, so, so those are some of the, the key, the key takeaways. Yeah. And one of the exciting things that's coming as well is AWS announced their Graviton 2 instances. And, um, and so we're in the process now of, enabling the FME engine and FME server to leverage those. And the nice thing about those is their cost is even lower. Um, the Graviton 2 is still high performance, but it's lower cost because it uses way less electricity, which means it generates less heat, which means they can pack them tighter together. And, uh, but to the user, it, uh, it means that um, the, the cost is lower. And the nice thing about FME is FME at one point ran on five processors. We used to run on Intel and Solaris and HPUX and IBM AIX and DEC Alpha. I think that's five. And, um, and so now to be able to run on Intel for Linux and uh, Windows and also um, ARM for Graviton2 is, uh, is no, no problem at all. So uh, you can look forward to that and then that would uh, lower the cost even further. Yeah, so there we go. So thanks, um, Grant and Laura. The Zipster thanks you. Without you two, there's no way this would have been able to be be pulled off. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I, I it was a lot of fun to uh, attempt such a crazy thing. And um, and the Zipster, the Zipster thanks you. And um, and the lizard is totally impressed. And I'm glad to see that the the lizard gave the Zipster the popcorn there yeah yeah i think it was definitely a lot of fun we learned a lot and uh yeah it's great and i, I think yeah ten thousand next year why not let's go absolutely why not <laughs> how about you laura mm -hmm. yeah it's always exciting to see what we can do with fme and yeah i'm definitely be down for the challenge for ten thousand engines next year <laughs> <laughs> so there we go so thanks everybody and um we just remind you to visit the World's Fair and there's the map and um, you can see there's lots of lots of things. If you go to the doctor's office, for example, you would be able to talk and reach out to um, Grant um, and Laura and myself and talk about more detail about this. There's lots of ways to meet people on social media, 
and um, and just lots of great talks. The Partner Pavilion. I don't know of anybody else who has done this, but we've have. Um, you know, I'm close, I think 18 partners who have probably more, but if you go in there, then you're going to see presentations from our partners around the world who, after all, it is a world's fair and um, a world's fair means there's uh, contributions from people from around the world. And so please do um, engage that and, um, and uh, have lots of fun.